Welcome to this journey where we dialogue with thought and heart leaders to share their reflections on human condition and how to improve them. Today we have with us Benjamin J. Butler. Benjamin is a futurist, writer, speaker and exponential coach. He is the founder of Quantum Futures. He sits on the Global Future Council on Computing at the World Economic Forum and is a member of the Faculty of Future IO, the European Institute of Exponential Technologies and Desirable Futures. Benjamin is um, how does one even begin to make sense of what's happening and what I'm what I'm really looking at is uh, a person like you who's a futurist and who's advising uh, people on on people and companies on various aspects of their business in future here is a crisis that's standing at ho at the doorstep it's already hit a lot of people and and how are you how are you how do you think about how do you think through something like this yeah it's a uh, it's a it's a great question um ideally uh one is engaged with a futurist uh, or doing some future thinking from the outset so that when something like this strikes uh you have done some scenario analysis uh there's some inbuilt resilience in your organization or or your household um so you know that's the first the first point uh that um we should always be prepared for uh not live in fear uh in fact it reduces fear by being it's sort of a i guess a a, a 101 of being a cub scout uh uh would be to be prepared and um i think um that's part of the problem people are not prepared for abrupt change uh even though uh from my position uh it's been obvious i mean it was obvious after the gfc the last big financial crisis that we would be we'd have a series of very large crises over the ensuing decade or two um really accelerating we thought from 2015 to 2025 we thought would be a, a particularly tumultuous period but this the whole 2020s is going to be uh, up and down we can talk about that later but um to 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 go into your question a bit more um so aside from you know always scanning the horizon for risks and opportunities and scenarios um how do you make sense of it now that it's landed on our our shores and this this requires i think it does require holistic thinking um uh, it um i think that uh in recent well maybe recent years things have started to change but uh i was born into a, an era of sp specialists and our academic process was very segmented so we weren't really look trying to join the dots uh because you look at a crisis like this and um you you can't just um you can't just call up uh an epidemiologist and let them uh g get their advice on every dimension of your business or life because they know something about viruses um in fact they might not know that much about statistics i was just talking to another futurist yesterday uh how uh, someone like Nassim Taleb who was a well-known um mathematician who wrote black swan and anti fragile et etc um he might be in a better position than an epidemiologist to to make some pointers um uh an economist might give you some uh ideas about the economic ramifications uh of it which could all be tied up in the medical response i mean everything is interlinked uh which is why i i try i i engage with many experts in separate fields and then i i try and sit back and and uh to use the cliche join join the dots dots but but uh, apply um some uh systemic thinking interesting so uh, 
so what i hear you say is uh, uh, at the core of this is this this interdisciplinary and the systemic approach to to even frame the nature of the challenge that we have uh, let alone getting to the solution part of it sure yeah yeah i mean we can we can delve into that a little bit but part part of the problem uh, of all of this is that our our the, the reason we're not reacting so well to the coronavirus um, and why it's such a problem is uh, our system is intrinsically not that resilient. Yeah. Uh, that that that's and that's on the economic on economics. That's um, uh, healthcare. Uh, that's a, f a fundamental issue. Suppose somebody were to uh, come in this conversation right now and, you know, probably a cynic and would probably try to give us a pushback to what we are saying and would say, what gives us the belief that the existing response is not the best response because there's no con counterfactual to, to really look at. Uh, how would one even frame that this is not the best response perhaps? Uh, good question. Um well the alternative well first of all you can say there are different responses in different countries uh so you can compare between countries that's that's pretty easy uh look at the response of singapore which i don't think has had a fatality yet if i'm not mistaken um it, despite the proximity to the, the initial outbreak and the fact that there's constant movement between china and singapore right Right. Look at South Korea, which did have a, an outburst and then rapidly controlled that. Uh, contrast that to Iran uh, or um, uh, northern Italy. Uh, and let's see what happens in the UK, US. We've taken a very different approach. In fact, I was talking to a, a futurist in the Netherlands yesterday, and he said, well, the Netherlands and the UK really stand out in not shutting the system down as quickly as the rest of Europe. So we shall, we, we shall see. Um, yeah. um, I, I would, yeah, I would say as a, as humanity, we could be dealing with this better, but then y your, your cynic or your critic would say, well, show me another planet that's doing it better. And I, I don't have that in my back pocket, but, but I can, uh, I'd like to frame it in a positive way, and we can talk about this later, in that I think the coronavirus, um, you know, part of being a futurist is to reframe things, uh, not not to put your head in the sand, like, um, you know, let's look out um, into the distance as to what um, um, what's on the horizon. But when, um, when trouble strikes, uh, can, can you reframe it? Um, and for me, one of the reframes is um, it's a wonderful opportunity to look at the, the, the lack of resilience in our system and how can we increase that. And uh, I've got a whole, I wrote a, a blog about that recently. Yeah, in interesting, Benjamin. So you connecting uh, on, on an everyday hourly basis, you would be connecting with so many people uh, as this thing is, is, is spreading or panning out. What are the what are the kind of questions you're hearing most of the people ask you? Um, well, let me uh, let me correct one thing. Um, in a past life, I was a I was a, an investor, a trader, and I would be l looking at screens constantly, uh, sometimes eighteen hours a day, uh, looking at financial markets, uh, and always uh, like literally addicted to the news, but. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not doing that at the moment. I'm. I'm keeping abreast of things. Uh, but uh, I also think um, it's important to create space uh, and um, silence in one's life, so you can actually digest information and and make uh, sensible, uh, unemotional, uh, but sometimes intuitive uh, decisions. Uh, but I, I am speaking to people throughout the day. People are asking me questions um, and remaining calm and collected is, is another strong message I have for people. So in addition to being a, a forecaster uh, and, and a futurist, I coach a lot of leaders and I, I see that as all 
uh, in, interconnected um, being a, um, a sounding board. Um, Interesting. Uh, <coughs> so going back to actually maybe framing it differently, the question, um, suppose if I were to say that questions are more like devices or, you know, uh, sort of our lens with which we can look out and fetch for some information. Uh, in some sense, once we define the question, they also define some ways the boundaries of the answer. Um, so how, how would you be working your way through questions, using questions to, to even get sense of what's happening right now? So what are, what are the kind of questions that have come up for you while looking at what's happening, the phenomena? Um, well, I mean, the kind of questions I'm being asked are, are things like, how, when will this be over? How serious will it become? Um, uh, what are the e economic ramifications? Will the Olympics go ahead? <laughs> will um, uh, shall I hold? You know, I've got a corporate event in whatever month. Can I still hold it? Um, will it make sense to even hold it, even if the virus has passed? Um, has this, you know, has this been the trigger for the the, the big avalanche, the next financial avalanche that we were all kind of expecting? Um, what does it mean for China-U.S. relations? Has China emerged from this okay? Are they actually going to use this now as an opportunity to forge ahead in their race against um, the U.S.? Um, so many questions. Um, and, um, you know, o often in the scientific method, one has a, a question and, and a hypothesis, and then you narrow in, uh, which... which it, has gifted humanity with so many great great things but i, I also think when looking for, for me personally what i've learned is when looking at a phenomenon and trying to understand it i try not to jump into the the, the hypothesis uh too um too quickly um or the question even um in fact um i was reading um so if i can find it whilst we're uh, on air um I was, I was talking to a group of scientists this week. Uh, we we're talking about the future of science. It was um, with the World Economic Forum. Uh, they they have a group I think called the Young Young Scientists, like the Young Global Leaders. So there were a bunch of scientists there, some interesting people, and um, I happened to be reading a a book about the history of Western science, um, which. Um, uh, called Quicksilver, written by uh, a um, uh, a science fiction writer, but, it, but it's an excellent synopsis of. Some of it's made up; it's a story. But but uh, in the opening chapter, there's a quote from uh, Roger Coates, uh, who wrote the preface to Isaac Newton's Principia, one of the most important scientific texts. Uh, uh, in in my country's history and may, maybe the planets, uh, those who assume hypotheses as first principles of their speculation may indeed form an ingenious romance, but a romance it will still be. And what what I and I love that quote because I met a group of scientists um, a few years ago who did science in the way I. Um, the way I approached futurism and, and the way I approached investment before that, when I was an investor, and that was that they were they called themselves Goethean scientists, and of course, uh, Johann von Goethe was known by many as a poet, but but actually he was a scientist as well, and uh, the the that he would encourage you when you study a phenomenon, you engage with it. Uh, from as many dimensions as possible. Um, if it was a physical phenomenon like a tree, you would draw pictures of it, you would smell it, you'd touch it, you look at it from all different dimensions, you'd look at it over time, um, and um, you might not jump in to measure it. Uh, well, and you, you'd measure it and use sort of these kind of scientific quantitative measurements as well but but you might not j jump so quickly into the 
into the questions and the hypotheses first. Um, having that sort of mind, um, in a way, Zen Zen philosophy, Eastern philosophy has helped me a lot as a as an investor and then as a, a futurist because it's holding that mind, uh, what we call in Zen, that don't know mind. Um, and, and that's the biggest mind you can have. You don't know. You just observe it and play with it. And and then you maybe start to refine it. Um, but I mean, this is kind of theoretical and I'm saying this, um, you know, we can, I'm totally happy to jump into the specifics of what I think is going on with the pandemic and all the rest of it. But this just might help um, help leaders uh, in their approach to any and, and any problem. Interesting. And uh, I'm 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 just as uh, this is my assumption here. Um, when you describe this as an approach, uh, uh, if we if we park it for a minute and then we look at the people who are at the helm who are supposed to take decisions now, uh, you know, in terms of policy response to what they're seemingly calling the medical crisis and the economic crisis, the intersection of it. Uh, and on a daily basis, they have to take those decisions. Uh, uh, one can, I, I don't want to use the per word pardon, but one can pardon them of not having the view that the lens that you perhaps are recommending, and they still have to take these decisions. Do you think that something like this could still be uh, you know, you can you can build it on the go and still be taking decisions, or does this take time to develop as a practice? Um, no, you can do both concurrently. Uh, you you can, in a way, it's what I like as an investor. I would have told you I was doing micro analysis and macro analysis, so I was I was changing the size of the lens constantly. One minute going right into the minutia, and then the next minute taking a break and like zooming out. Uh, you know, if you're the Prime Minister uh, of the UK today, yeah, you've got to be zooming into the weeds, looking at the minutia. But I don't know. I, I don't think it's a um, a, a luxury for for uh, a, a top leader to spend half an hour, an hour, uh, zo like totally zooming out uh, in the method that that uh, I suggested. Of course, the best time to respond to a crisis is before the crisis has happened uh it's you know preparing and doing future scenarios then um it's easy you've already done the big picture thinking that was the whole idea of scenario analysis in the first place when um herman khan popularized popularized that he was a military strategist at rand and one of the sort of yeah. big figures of, of futurism and then peer whack um at Sh was the first corporate futurist. Uh, so these guys were thinking way ahead. But yeah, you can be doing it uh, on on the run. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin, in the next few minutes, if you can weigh in on how do you see the phenomena? Uh, how, how do you see the phenomena happening? Like, what would you say to the phenomena happening? Uh, uh, you mean so the, the coronavirus? Pandemic, yeah, the pandemic that's yeah. happening right now. Yeah. So. Um, so on the it's all in it's all interlinked but um it uh, i've regarded the medical uh, crisis as as quite serious as as quite serious that, that there's a reason why the chinese took such aggressive action um early on now people s wanted to criticize china at the beginning but um and it, they locked down a city of 11 million people after not that many cases to be honest uh the the it was unfortunate it was at chinese new year so um of course western media that's at the moment you've got this the backdrop of us china tension so the media is not being particularly friendly towards china um of course it is their job to be critical of anyone and anything but um that it that was a, a backdrop but after a a relatively small number of cases they locked down a major city and um brought in military doctors uh took pretty ag aggressive action used very advanced technology uh, i was mind blown by seeing drones flying up to people's balconies so that they could have their temperature taken and didn't have to go into a hospital and in potentially infect people uh, so all sorts of 
technologies um, uh, are going to come out of this. Um, but um, so the Chinese response was pretty good, of course, from a Western libertarian perspective, there are question marks. Um, and um, now we moved, literally, I wrote a blog comparing the approaches of the West and the East 10 days ago and and, and suggested stage two was upon us. Uh, and then within a couple of days, the WHO announced it was a pandemic and the epicenter had moved to Europe. Europe. So we're in phase two. Chinese now are um, uh, more worried about uh, visitors uh, coming in and infecting people, as is Hong Kong. Uh, and um, so if I want to go back to, to Hong Kong in the next uh, week or two, I'm, I'll have to go into some form of quarantine because I'm in the UK at the moment. Um, the, the reason why the Chinese took it so seriously is because it's um, a very highly infectious disease uh, and um, you can leave it on a surface for more than a week and, and survive. It, it, um, it, you can sneeze and it can stay in the air. Um, and because of the asymptomatic um, nature yeah. uh, that you can be a, a super spreader or whatever the word is, a carrier, uh, and not have not have symptoms. So it's a fact that it could infect so many people. Now, the fatality rate people can argue with um, a, a senior member of the uh, Singaporean administration said, the, you can bring the fatality rate down to 1% in a very good healthcare system that's not inundated. Pe people talk about the fatality rates as though it's a, it's like a static scientific fact. Um, and um, this is the way people, unfortunately, talk about science today. Science is actually about uncertainty and and often probabilities, not not you know, a scientific fact. People love saying that word nowadays, but it's, we have lots of temporary hypotheses, let's put it that way. Um, and the fatality rate, um, it, uh, it can change. So if your system's been completely overwhelmed and the healthcare system runs out of respirators, then it seems pretty obvious, applying common sense, that the fatality rate's going to go a lot higher than in a place that's... Um, calm collected and um the, the system's working so um um so anyway uh compared to the common cold which they say on average is 0.1 percent fatality rates people are talking about any anywhere between one and three three percent it's 10 20 times higher so that's why they took it seriously when, when you've got a fatality rate that's 20 times higher and could rapidly cover a very high percentage of the population, obviously that's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of death. You know, Mer Merkel shocked everyone over a week ago. I wrote it in my blog when she said to Parliament she thought 50, 70 percent of the German population would contract it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why, that's why they, many people took it uh, very seriously. What what do I think? I, I think the the average individual's chance, if you've got a um, not an existing health, health issue and um, and you you keep your immunity boost boosted, you know we all like to take drugs and stuff when there's a problem, but actually just drinking green juices, take eating things in high vitamins and having lots of superfoods. I've started taking my my Korean ginseng again. Um, th th this is going to probably have a lot more of an impact than taking uh, most medicines after the fact, quite frankly. Um, so on an individual basis, I, I obviously say to people, don't don't panic, take take preemptive action, and um, keep calm and carry on, as they uh, as they say in the, in the UK. Um, so. Um, but um, so then moving on, the, the really serious ramifications at, at an aggregate level turn out to be economic. Uh, unless you let your healthcare system 
really get inundated. So if you're not being preemptive, then suddenly healthcare systems inundated, and then it's it's mayhem. And I feel bad because probably people needing other operations might have to be postponed, and that there's all these sort of second, third order ramifications, which are which are unfortunate. Um, um, Oh yeah, before I shift on to economic, let me just say um, the hope by many was that this would peak out in, let's say, Europe, uh, US in the in the next month to two months, and then follow a trajectory where in the northern hemisphere it 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 dies down into into the summer months, but. Um, friends of mine that have been looking at data in uh, the southern hemisphere at the moment are saying that the rates in Argentina are doubling every few days as well. So there might not be such a, a temperature correlation and we shouldn't bet on that. The uh, the Singapore health minister said said the same thing. So I, um, so I think SARS took four months to sort out. This is obviously more serious than SARS. So um, it's, um, yeah, we, we can talk about all sorts of scenarios. Yeah. But let, let, let's say the virus has peaked out within six, six months. The, the problem is the, the economic ramifications to this are, are, are huge. And, and I guess that's why people like Boris Johnson um, and Donald Trump are, are, are feeling uh, compromised because they they uh, they're trying to apply they're talking to experts but trying to apply common sense because at an individual level the risks of dying from this don't appear to be so high uh, but, but if they shut down the economies completely um the economic ramifications are, are horrendous uh, and other forms of death can can result or at least a lot of pain and suffering uh, so uh, uh Perhaps we can sort of move it. They're interlinked, but we, if, um, oh, and the other risk for the virus is that of mutation, that that comes up in conversations as well. Yeah. And um, what, what, what if it mutates into the next winter season and, and gets, gets stronger? Um, so um, economic ramifications. Uh, I was talking to a top, investor in the city of london yesterday and he said uh, he's talking to clients and he doesn't really have any anecdotes or metaphors to give his clients because uh, he's just never in his whole 30-year career has never been here before and i said well yeah there aren't any really any models in the last 100 years it's almost a combination of the 9-11 which was a a complete exogenous shock to the system where things had to shut down overnight. Uh, but of course it's worse. Um, the airline industry is being hit harder than after 9-11. Uh, and secondly, it's like 9-11 plus the GFC because the financial system was not in a rosy state uh, before this started. Uh, so let's think about that um i mean the bet the best analogy might even be a war, uh, wartime footing you know people are saying talking about being on a wartime footing b because things are just being shut down completely yeah. uh, so in, fact, in fact in the morning i was listening to to a debate happening and uh, i think anthony scaramucci the former white house communication guy who's also i think part of the skybridge capital he, he, he put the metaphor or analogy to the World War II where he said that uh, uh, in his, in his uh, memory the, the way the government tackled it was put in 20% in terms of the easing uh, money into the, into the markets uh, and that is the best analogy that he could get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, there's nothing like this in, in peacetime really. Um, in, in in the last hundred years, let's say, um, of course, Europe has suffered from the plague, and well, many countries have suffered from um, 
all sorts of plagues in the past but um like the black death but um uh so let's look let's look at this um uh from a perspective of economics the, the global economy was already at what i call stall speed going into this crisis by the fourth quarter of last year japanese gdp was down six over six percent annualized uh if you look at all the global barometers of manufacturing they were they've been going south for quite a long time uh in the us they were saying um that it really it was just the consumer holding things up but um everything else was looking quite weak and the the forward looking indicators on consumption were not were not so not so good um if you looked at uh corporate earnings they they'd been falling for three four consecutive quarters uh, in the US uh chinese gdp before the coronavirus already hit its lowest um number for 29 years so this was before the coronavirus hit and so i was already telling people we were ready, really really ready things were ripe for a, a global uh recession uh secondly and and let, let, let let's remember the, the 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 governments various governments in in the big economies were saying that unemployment rates were improving but uh if you if you look at things from the perspective of the financial resilience of the average man or woman it wasn't so good you know we all have heard that the data point in the US that half the population didn't even have enough money in the bank account for a 400 US dollar emergency that they'd have to put it on a credit card um so um you had that on the economic side uh then you have the financial economy which is intertwined with the economy and we've just had the biggest monetary policy experiment ever and since 2009 all these different assets have been going up there's been speculation in so many different areas and as warren buffett said we we'll, we'll only know who was swimming naked when the tide comes out and so i i can guess some areas where there was speculation and people will suffer when reality comes back um let's take high yield some of the high yield debt areas of the US economy um a lot of speculation there uh shale gas um it's uh, now with Russia and Saudi Arabia having a bit of a oil conflict a couple of weeks we we people are starting to wake up to the fact that maybe american shale gas wasn't so economic their their um their production cost is way way higher than the whatever a couple of dollars it costs the saudis and the 7 8 dollars it costs um the uh russians to produce an, uh, a a barrel of oil um that's pre pre tax so um so that that whole sector could could go up in smoke but it's it's uh the, there are these covenant light bonds i mean the corporate america went on a and not just corporate america uh corporations around the world have been on a on a binge and um we we're, we're going to see we're going to see who's been swimming with without uh without swimming trunks or whatever warren buffett said um and and you, you can tell it, to me what i've seen since the gfc it remind some of it reminds me of japan in the 1980s when um in that in their low interest rate uh environment they um uh they had uh, what was called zitec in japanese which was financial engineering on a massive scale and um so take um I think I think like about 50% of the free cash flow of the S&P 500 um please fact check this but it is a significant number and it's like 50% has gone into share buybacks in the last decade so why has corporate america 
and, and many other corporates around the world. Why haven't they invested in the future? They've just invested in pushing their stock price up. And of course, the the boards of directors get, get paid more if their stock prices are higher. And, you know, the, the cynic would say they're only doing the buybacks so that they can pay themselves off and, and quickly retire because by the time the the chickens come home to roost, um, they they'll all be already be retired. Um, so you now have a ridiculous situation where the airline industry is essentially in the U.S. asking for a bailout uh, because things are worse than nine eleven. Yet they've put no money aside for a rainy day. They they spent in some cases like ninety percent of their cash flow on. Uh, on on buybacks, which is insane for an industry where you don't need to be an expert to realize there's volatility in in that industry, and there are also every ten years or less there there could be some major event. You know, we've had nine eleven, we've had the great financial crisis. Um, um, if you're doing, if you're a futurist working with the airline industry. Of course, you would have pandemics as a a, a risk. Um, you would not need a a PhD in uh, aviation to point point that uh, risk out. So, what the hell are they? What happened? So, yeah. as a society, do we have to bail them bail them out? Um, and this this is the this this is the other economic. Um, well, I, 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 I'll finish off on finance and then then talk about the the political ramifications. Um, so, in in synopsis, we have a financial system that has huge systemic problems, lots of speculation built into it, and an economy that was already a little bit weak, and you have this huge uh, exogenous shock. So. Clearly, uh, the, the the recipe for quite a, a deep uh, recession or even depression at this stage. Um, yeah, um, I guess that, that, that's. Oh, yeah, and so um, I try and keep this as simple as possible. So you've got so much complexity and feedback loops and etc. going on. That's why it's so difficult um, to explain what. What, what I think is going on because, um, you know, they're still arguing about what happened in 2008 uh, because most people are not systemic thinkers. So some people think it was Lehman Brothers kicked it all off, but um, that there are all these like really ad- complex butterfly effects going on. But let me just say that um, you had a fragile macroeconomy and exogenous shock in the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, you also had another shock that still is reverberating. People aren't talking about it, and that was the China-U.S. Trade, trade war, war yeah. uh, which was also which is also a supply side shock, and will continue. Americans companies are being encouraged to pull their global supply chains out of China and go go back home, and the Chinese are because of their experience are. Uh, uh, are being obviously careful about um, the way they uh, interact with the US. So that's in the background and that can come back. You know, as coronavirus, if coronavirus gets better, the trade war uh, rears its ugly head ag- ag- again as well. So you've got these exogenous supply side shocks, uh, an underlying economy with weak demand, and a financial system that's incredibly precarious. And once once the financial markets of once you have financial markets fall in 10 percent in a day and 30 percent from peak to trough uh suddenly the financial markets then also join the feedback loop and make th- the underlying economy worse so so benjamin uh, do you then think and if you look at last uh, uh i i can't i can't really map it to how many days but we're hearing a lot of uh, governments announcing big packages. You know, uh, America announcing a trillion plus, and 
Spain announcing 200 billion plus and then Germany saying whatever it takes and UK saying whatever it takes and slowly most economies are joining this chorus. Uh, are we then saying that this is again an era of you know socializing losses in some sense because the question is where is going to be the money coming from eventually uh, and so how do you see this, this, this as a scenario? Yeah so that, that ties nicely into we, we, we took a pause on talking about airlines and Essentially, the governments are in a um, difficult situation. If you have any empathy for them, some people were just totally fed up with politicians all around the world. But um, uh, if you have any empathy for them, it's it's they're in a difficult situation. In that, in the last in the GFC, they bailed out all the bankers and a few big corporations, and tens of millions of people in the US got turfed out of their homes. Uh, even worse, a couple of years later, the bankers got record bonuses again. And you had big financial private equity firms hoovering up all the houses um, that people were kicked out of because they couldn't pay their mortgages. And so you had a, a crazy situation where a private equity firm was, I think, one of the largest owners of property in um, in the US. The US was a bit extreme. But all around the world, banks were were bailed out. So here we are um, 10 years or more later, and I was always expecting a GFC too. I've been consistently writing about that, but this is probably even bigger now than G GFC too. So I don't think that word will apply. Uh, this time around, they if they only bail out some financial institutions that the pitchforks will be out in the Western world that they'll they'll be facing coup d'etat's um, revolution. I mean, literally. So then they know that. So that's why they're they're literally talking about bailing everyone out. And you know, Mnuchin. I mean, I'm not following the minutia hour by hour, um, but in a way, one just has to zoom out. And, um, you know, at yesterday's pref co press conference, Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, was talking about sending checks to Americans within a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was thinking it is more like universal basic stimulus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they got a kind of bail, like, they, they feel like they're, they're talking about bailing out airlines and various other industries. And they're talking about bailing out the average man and woman, either whether it's uh, you know, them not having to pay tax for a while or different forms of loans. Um, so everyone's going to be bailed out simplistically. Of course, so many, uh, lots of people are going to fall in the, between the cracks, but it, we're, we're kind of looking at the aggregate level. Uh, that suddenly means um, what we thought was the biggest monetary policy experiment in history uh, isn't over. It's that the size of the stimulus is is going to be trillions and trillions now in, in the next six to 12 months. And and governments can use we're, we're, the, the fact we're on a wartime foot in and you saw in the ha House of Parliament committee yesterday in the UK during the World War Two, there were years where we uh, had um, deficits of 20% of GDP. So they feel like they've got carte blanche now to to bail everyone out, um, including their best buddies in the financial and corporate sector, but everyone else. Uh, what does that leave us with? That that leaves us with, we've had a big deflationary shock. And I was talking to a, a top city fund manager yesterday. That could mean a few years down the road, um, we're left with this extreme amount of debt. Do we finally now have that moment of inflation or hyperinflation um so that is the that's the that's the that's the potential f fallout from this um on on the horizon but i got a lot of, i've got a lot of positive things to say as well uh Herman. so um please go ahead please go ahead. I, I i wouldn't want to uh, end <laughs> end on that note so the these are the kind of waters that we're we're navigating at the same time uh, as a as a as a futurist, uh, my my conversations around the world with futurists at the moment are actually quite upbeat in many ways. Um, 
uh, when I talk to leaders who have to think on a six month, 12 month, um, 18 month reality, they're very worried. And as are um, investors who have to manage risk. But um, the, the good news is uh, I think this accelerates the death of an old system uh, and the birth uh, of a new and and that we're going through um what to borrow a word from physics uh we're going through a phase transition uh which is like ice becoming water or steam and um, we've only been through two phase transitions in recorded history and that was when we transitioned from hunter gatherer to farmer essentially and we built cities so the beginning of civilization that was the first some people describe that as the agricultural revolution the first agricultural revolution um, and it that resulted in more uh, written language all sorts of aspects of, of culture um, and, and then the second phase transition arguably was uh, the um, going from farmer to industrialist uh, in the industrial revolution which started about 1712 uh, that, that's when James Lovelock uh, cites it when uh, Thomas Newcomen uh, discovered the, the the first steam engine so uh, we could be going through I think we're going through something as as big as that our, our entire civilization is changing um, well beyond the fourth industrial revolution which is the term we use at the world economic forum uh, which i'm involved in and have hu huge respect for but uh, I, I think it's it's bigger than that but you know carl schwab who likes using the word fourth industrial revolution probably understands there are bigger forces at work and at the moment it looks like the fourth industrial revolution you know we have artificial intelligence and various other technologies being applied but but I, I believe it's much bigger than that. And essentially, we're moving into the post-industrial civilization, which um, some people would say should have ended soon after the Club of Rome wrote their report, um, Limits to Growth. And the first environmentalists came out and warned us that, that our system was destroying our planet and ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so so that's hugely positive and and a lot of futurists i'm talking to think that, that this is all going to accelerate new technologies new ways of thinking new ways of organizing ourselves that that's um yeah. that, that that's um let me just say when you're in the valley of death <laughs> when, when lots of things are going wrong or, or things are a bit chaotic um if you can just look back up at the horizon it it can give you a lot of uh in inner peace and you can remember hey this is a great time to provide leadership this is a great time to be extra passionate about what i'm trying to build in the world yeah uh, just to just to understand this a little better and we'll just spend a few more minutes uh, around this and then a final closing comment from you but when you talk about phase transition and we talk about the hunter gatherer then settling down in some sense and settling down in forms of communities where you have some kind of you know more certainties more order beyond the disorders or in order to take care of the disorder and then you move and create these industrial towns and cities which is again creating more of a repetitive kind of scenarios and while doing that there was a lot of centralization that happened in some sense are you then saying that the centralization has peaked and now it's the turn towards a decentralization uh, and technology is going to boost that? Yeah. Absolutely. The, the, the way forward, the only way our species will survive is through decentralization. Uh, and I'm an optimist, so I believe that we will follow that only path. So I don't believe in more, more centralization. Um, in fact, just uh, a, a way f for some people to reframe Brexit uh, it is actually it was a, it's just a great example of decentralization it it wasn't some people think it's suddenly overnight all british people suddenly became or half the country became xenophobic and and hated europe um that's not 
borne out in the research that I did. Um, and if you look globally, lots of regions are trying to break away from bigger states or super states. And um, the, the, um, the EU, look at the EU this week. That there's been no EU wide control of what's going on. The best things are happening at the local levels, um, and, and the really good stuff. I'm sure, uh, perhaps it won't make the news, but the acts of kindness from stranger to stranger, or or the guy I saw on TV yesterday who was closing his flower shop down, that was running around, handing out free flowers to passers-by and cars. Uh, you know the 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 responsibility and the power needs to come back down uh, to the individual, but also to the local uh, area. And and nature nature organizes itself in self organizing systems. And arguably, nature's done a a pretty good job for three point five billion years. You know, in the field of biomimicry, they say uh, we must leverage off the 3.5 billion years of R&D that, 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 that nature's done. So, so that's why I, uh, I went and studied ecology a few years ago, because I thought rather than spending a whole year studying AI, which could have got me a great job with Google, for example, um, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But as a futurist, I wanted to understand where we could be heading. And I, I think we're, we're moving to more of an ecological uh, civilization. That doesn't mean we, we all be, become members of Greenpeace um, and become environmentalists. It, it means fundamentally we move, we embrace technology, uh, blockchain, 3D printing, all these other decentralized technologies. And, and we also reconnect with nature and our cities will become greener again, okay. et cetera, et cetera. And, and nature, you know, you talk to ecologists and one of their favorite words is adaptability complex adaptable systems ecosystems uh that's what we need to create um resilient adaptable systems we don't have that with global supply chains the way we manufacture things our financial system we don't have that Just so the very yeah, all those kind of things, yeah. yeah yeah so so coronavirus um is showing that that uh it well is one of many things that's showing that that system is not going to not going to work. I, I think it's inevitable we, we move that way. Of course, people show me counter evidence. You'll, you'll have some strong men leaders who uh, who might be nationalistic, or some people will say the only way we can deal with climate change is by, you know, at the level of the UN and or, or giving some central body huge amounts of power over everyone and ordering them to do things. I I, I don't I don't buy that. I, I, I think people are. Um, I think we'll be moving to decentralized systems and um, it, you can still go global with decentralized systems. It's called replication. It, something works in a little town in England uh, and uh, then a little town in Wales think here's what well, they're flourishing. I'll, I'll copy their what they're doing. And then suddenly a, a town in America, you know, with, with with this globalized communication we have, Things can spread very, very quickly. But um, I think this this bigger topic is obviously a whole podcast. Uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, we'll get to uh, that. So, so Benjamin, thank you so much for your time and your insights, your warmth, and uh, uh, really like the optimistic note that you closed this on. And uh, I hope and pray that uh, we all stay safe and exercise our own caution and connect in deeper ways with each other and with our own self. Uh, so thank you. Thank, thank you so much for your time, uh, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you. And I'd just like to say at the very end um, that there's so much one can do as a as an individual. And um, uh, I think it's a great time to to stop. If you uh, stop, connect to family. A Pope said it yesterday. Use it as an use this as an opportunity to connect to, to loved ones. Um, Use it as an opportunity to meditate. Use it as an opportunity to to try and eat healthily, um, and um, 
uh, this this pause in the global economy could turn out to be a, a very good thing indeed.